about Israel's situation. On the map, the area to the south and east of Israel is called Gaza or the Gaza Strip. During the Six-Day War in 1967, in a defensive action, Israel took control of Gaza from Egypt. In fact, Israel took the entire Sinai Peninsula, this whole area, from Egypt. Later, Israel returned the Sinai Peninsula, but deemed Gaza too great a threat to be in the hands of a mortal enemy, which Egypt proved to be at that time. So Israel kept control over Gaza. Today, Egypt does not even want Gaza. And to Israel's east, we find what the media and much of the world calls the West Bank. Well, the name refers to the West Bank of uh, the Jordan River, uh, but the real name is Judea and Samaria. It is the name that God has given it in the Bible. Uh, Together, it is Israel. And God not only called it Israel in the past, but in the present And when the Jews began to return to the land, and in the Bible it is always called Israel, and throughout the last days, and even when Jesus comes back, and then into the millennial kingdom, God always calls it by the name that he gave it, Israel, its ancient biblical name, and Jerusalem, the place of the Jews, no matter what the UN says. But along with Gaza, Israel also took the area of Judea and Samaria from Jordan as part of its defensive action in the Six-Day War. And today, Jordan does not want uh, Judea and Samaria back. If we return to the 1967 or pre-1967 borders, as many have suggested, Egypt would take Gaza and Jordan the West Bank. But no one wants that, least of all Egypt and Jordan. Understand this. People say, well, there would be peace in the land if Israel went back to the pre-1967 borders. No, there would not be peace in the land. They didn't have peace before pre-1967 borders. What on earth makes people say there would be peace now? There wouldn't be. In, In 2005, a gesture of goodwill And with no compensation or compromise from the other side, Israel gave control of Gaza to the Palestinian people. They left them vast resources and the basis of a prosperous economy, which the Palestinians promptly destroyed. At first, the Palestinian Authority was in charge when Israel left Gaza, but the very next year, they held an election in Gaza. It was the last election held in the Palestinian territories, and in retrospect, it's easy to see why. Gazans chose to put a terror group, Hamas, in charge. Hamas doesn't allow elections because, to them, there's no point. They're already in charge. The Palestinian Authority has never again allowed elections for fear that Hamas would gain even more control. And if you think elections don't have consequences, look at the people of Gaza. They've been paying for one bad election for almost 20 years. And for the record, the people we call Palestinians are Arabs indigenous to the region, along with Arabs whose nation, nations excuse me, shipped them into the region just before Israel became a nation in 1948. For the most part, they left at the urging of Arab governments who promised them they could quickly return because the Arab nations would soon destroy Israel. But that didn't happen. And many of the descendants of these people still languish in refugee camps because the Arab nations, on whose orders they went to Israel and on whose orders they left their homeland, refused to integrate them back into their nations. They leave them in camps as though they were prisoners, and they are, to Israel's northeast we find the nation of Syria. Uh, The majority of Syrians are Sunni Muslim, uh, but they are ruled by a Shiite Muslim, Bashar al-Assad. A civil war against Assad began in 2011, and it is ongoing. When it looked like Assad was going to be overthrown, uh, Iran and Russia stepped in to save him, uh, turning the tide of the civil war. And then Lebanon sits to Israel's north. It was once a prosperous, highly Catholic nation. A a bastion of human rights and beauty in a Middle East where such things are rare. Beirut, Lebanon was known around the world as the Paris of the Middle East. 
from 1975 to 1990, a Lebanese civil war decimated the Catholic population and gave complete control to Muslims. No one calls it the Paris of the Middle East anymore. During the Lebanese civil war, two things happened that would have a powerful effect in facilitating the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. First, in 1979, the Ayatollah Khomeini uh, led a successful Islamic rebellion in Iran. From a moderate Muslim country run by the Shah, Iran became the number one state sponsor of terror in the world. Iran will be one of the two leading countries in the war on Israel prophesied in Ezekiel chapter 38. In a matter of days, they went from Israel's main Middle Eastern ally to its most hate-filled enemy. By the way, years ago, uh, I think it was around uh, in the 1970s, uh, Chuck Smith, the founder of Calvary Chapels, and used to be the host here on World News Briefing when World News Briefing first began. Um, Chuck Smith was standing on uh, the mountains of the Golan Heights. I think it was in the area near Mount Bental. Uh, Don Stewart was there with him. And Chuck was talking with one of the Israeli leaders. And, and the Israeli leader was talking about how friendly Iran or Persia was to Israel. And Chuck Smith said that is going to turn. Iran is going to become Israel's biggest enemy in the last days, according to the Bible. The Israeli leader didn't believe it. But it happened exactly as Chuck said it would, and Chuck said it because that is what the Bible teaches, and that's where we are today. All right. Second, Iran formed and funded a terror group, get this, in Lebanon called Hezbollah, if you're wondering where it came from. Make no mistake, Hezbollah has been the Iranian proxy since its beginning. In fact, one of the Iranian proxies, but it's its biggest one and most well-funded proxy, most well-funded terror group in the world. The Ayatollah Khomeini gave it its name and it was formed with Iranian money and the direct aid of 1,500 members of Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. At Hope for Our Times, our mission is to spread the hope of Jesus Christ. Israel's dilemma. On October 7th of last year, Hamas broke an existing ceasefire and attacked Israel, breaking every rule of civilized behavior, even between warring nations. Hezbollah wanted to avoid joining the war against Israel directly, but they wanted to help Hamas. So they started firing missiles into northern Israel beginning on October 8th. And since then... Hezbollah has hit Israel with some 9,000 plus missiles. With the war heating up, that number may have gone up considerably by the time you see this, especially over the events just in the last couple of days. Unbelievable. Hezbollah knew that the Biden administration, fearing a wider Mideast war, would pressure Israel to do little or nothing in response. They also knew that Israel was already in the middle of a major action with Hamas in Gaza. So they thought Israel would make do by, by sending uh, just a few missiles back at Lebanon. That's what happened at first. Israel evacuated towns, 70,000 people at, count, uh, at that last count, near the border and made small retaliatory strikes. But Hezbollah kept upping the ante, firing more and more missiles. It finally got so bad that Israel had no choice. It had to hit Hezbollah and hit them hard. Israel launched missile strikes targeted at specific Hezbollah leaders. Then came the pager and walkie-talkie attacks. How do you destroy a terrorist group embedded with civilians while doing as little harm to those civilians as possible? On September 17th and 18th, Israel chose to explode devices that would only be in the hands of Hezbollah militants. The small explosions would take place in the hands or pockets or on the belts of militant terrorists. From what we know, Israeli agents intercepted the devices somewhere along the supply line and they put the explosive peton inside the device's batteries. That's not a large amount of explosive. It was meant for the individual with the device, not people nearby. It was a brilliant military strategy. But according to Hezbollah, the two attacks killed 42 people and injured about 3,000 
500. They claim that 12 of those killed were civilians. We only have their word for that, but even if it's true, it proves the highly targeted nature of the attack. We have video showing Hezbollah militants going down when the devices exploded while people nearby did not sustain injuries. One of the sad facts of war is that innocents always die along with combatants. In fact, it's not unusual for civilian deaths to outnumber those of soldiers. No nation in the history of warfare has done so much as Israel to limit civilian casualties. Before Israel's recent missile attacks in Lebanon, they sent texts to people in the area warning them that the missiles were coming and to get out of there. In Gaza, not only did they send text messages, they sent non-lethal warning shots that acted as a mere tap to let Gazans know to evacuate the building. The Hamas and Hezbollah terrorists intentionally drive up the civilian casualty counts by hiding behind those civilians. Uh, they launch missiles from homes, mosques, schools, apartment buildings, and hospitals. Civilian casualties garner international sympathy for the terrorists, and that is their only hope of survival. And the evidence of the desire to drive up civilian casualties is even seen in the areas of northern Israel. For example, uh, when you look at Nazareth, Nazareth itself, the city of Nazareth, I've been there many times before, some of you certainly have too, is almost 100% Arab Muslim. Almost 100% Arab Muslim. Yet, it is being bombed every single day, nonstop, for the past week by Hezbollah. Why? They don't care if it is even their own brothers that die as long as the death and injury rate are high enough to blame Israel for the war so that they can win the propaganda war. That's all they care about. Another aid to terrorist propaganda is something embedded deep within the human psyche, and that is rebellion against God. It manifests itself in many ways, one of which is to attack the people to whom God made so many of his promises, the Jews. Islamic terrorists have learned that some people will choose any side over Jews. Feminists, for example, will side with those who degrade and oppress women. Homosexuals will side with the murders of homosexuals. That's why we see the LGBT community in support of Hamas. It makes no sense. And human rights activists will side with the most repressive of all regimes. Why? My friend, Olivier Melnick, gave the disturbing yet biblical answer. He said anti-Semitism is the irrational, satanic hatred of the Jewish people in Israel characterized by thoughts, words, and or deeds against them. I have yet to see another definition of anti-Semitism that includes the words satanic or demonic. That aspect of the problem is seldom, if ever, mentioned, but it is a key, if not the key component. I understand why CBS News or the Washington Post would not use Olivier's definition, but Bible-believing Christians should carefully consider the spiritual component of these events. Satan would, be, uh, would like nothing better than to abort the promises of God. He knows that God's end-time program on earth will center on promises made to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, and, and the others. That's why Satan works so hard to destroy Israel and the Jews. He wants to break the universe by making God's word a lie. He can't, of course, but he tries, and we see it all the time. That's why Olivier Melnick says anti-Semitism is the irrational, satanic hatred of the Jewish people and Israel. The name of the age is deception. And that's Satan's greatest tool. It was his greatest tool in the Garden of Eden, and it was his greatest weapon against Jews as the Nazis reigned in Germany. When presenting the signs of the latter days, Jesus listed deception first and often. In fact, we see it as a characteristic of the end times throughout the Bible. Deceivers deceive, creating more deceivers and more deceptions. In fact, it's a vicious cycle and uh, an ever-narrowing downward 
spiral. Uh, in fact, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, the Apostle Paul even wrote in the context of the last days, he said, evil men will wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. In other words, the deception is only going to grow, and so is the evil of these evil people. Critical mass will mean a nuclear-style explosion of deceit, mistrust, fear, and chaos in homes, businesses, schools, media, and throughout society. In, in some ways, it already feels that way. Deception is multiplying into an ever-darkening fog over all humanity. People are asking, who can I trust? Where can I get reliable information? Who's telling the truth? Well, my quick answer is to, is to stay close to the Bible. The, this book right here, it will not deceive you. It does not change. It is always for your good, and it never lies because it is God's word, and it cannot lie. Hence, God says, don't turn to the left or the right. You stay in the word, and you won't be deceived. You stay in the word, and you'll be able to make sense of what's going on today in a time when everything is just so unbelievably uh, coming together and changing and, and frightening if you don't know the Bible too. But even with the advent of high-tech tools of deception, the deceptions themselves still center on ancient prejudices like anti-Semitism. Listen, the Bible informs us that in the last days, two groups will face an increase in persecution, Christians and Jews with the Jews being the main target of the spiritual enemy, the devil himself. Why? Well, as you look at this and we look at what's going on, uh, the attention will go from the terrorists attacking from Gaza and Lebanon to, get this, to the city of Jerusalem and the Temple Mount itself. And as you begin to understand the target is Jerusalem, Jerusalem is the epicenter, it all starts to make sense. Did you know that when all this began on October 7, that the terrorists called their terror war the Al-Aqsa Flood? Well, what is that? Why is that? What does that mean? Well, Al-Aqsa, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, is the mosque that's on the Temple Mount. On the Temple Mount, you have the Gold Dome. That's the Dome of the Rock. That's not a mosque. And then you also have the Al-Aqsa Mosque that is on the southern side of the Temple Mount. Why did they call it the Al-Aqsa Flood? Because these terrorists know that the target is Jerusalem. Listen, it is not a coincidence that while all of this is happening to Israel, and there's an enormous increase of anti-Semitism throughout the world, especially the Western world, that we read such a thing in the news that the UN voted to make Jerusalem free from all Jews. Folks, this is like Hadrian. This is like Titus, Hadrian, who humiliated the Jews in 135 AD and humiliated Israel, changed the name of Israel to Palestine, and, started, and made sure that the Jews were the first ones called Palestinians. This is like the days of Titus, who in 70 AD, he went to destroy Jerusalem, and, and he did destroy the temple. The target is Jerusalem. That is where all of this is going. That is why they called it the Al-Aqsa Flood. Listen, all of this proves that the Bible is true. In fact, in Zechariah chapter 12, God says, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem, and it shall happen in that day I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. <clears throat> all who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces, though all the nations of the earth are gathered against it. Wow, in that day, says the Lord, I will strike every horse with confusion and its rider with madness. I will open my eyes on the house of Judah and I will strike every horse of the peoples with blindness. And the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, the inhabitants of Jerusalem are my strength in the Lord of hosts, their God. God says, listen, I will bring confusion upon the enemy. You look at what's happening right now as the people are making Jerusalem their target. 
I will bring confusion on the enemy. Look at how confused the United States of America is. Look at how confused our government is. Look at how confused they are over in Europe. Look at how confused the world is as they go against Israel. Look at how confused the enemy is. Look at what happened with the pagers and the walkie-talkies. Wow. God is going to be victorious and he is going to give the victory to Israel. And he says, I will cut in pieces all those who come against the city of Jerusalem. Listen, all of this proves that the Bible is true. In fact, if you go a few verses further in Zechariah chapter 12, you come to verse 10, where God says this, simply, I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication, and they will look on me whom they pierced. Who's me whom they pierced? Jesus pierced when he was hung on the cross. They will look upon me whom they pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. Folks, all of this is going there but uh, to that point, but we're not there yet. Right now, we can see this as a spiritual battle. All of it is, gives evidence that the Bible is true. Everything is happening just as the Bible said it will culminate in the last days. Ultimately, Israel's going to turn to the Lord. Ultimately, there, Israel's going to cry out for Yeshua, Hamashiach, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, to come and save them. That's what's going on there in Zechariah that I just read. It's also the world's attention is turning more and more towards Jerusalem. But it all proves that the Bible is true. Listen, 